Hello. Welcome everyone. For joining the Women in Dentistry webinar today. Let me first introduce myself. Hello. My name is Gina Lee Linton. I completed my dental education and studies at Yonsei University in South Korea and at Columbia University in New York City. Since 1991, I have run my own private practice as an orthodontist. I'm the vice president of Women Dentists Worldwide and participate as a committee member of FDI, the World Dental Federation. FDI, the World Dental Federation is an international organization representing 1 million dentists, 189 national dental associations and 133 countries. FDI's vision is primarily focused on leading the world to optimal oral health. WDW, also known as Women Dentists Worldwide, is a section in FDI. WDW takes on the responsibility of coordinating activities on National Women Dentist Group. We encourage the collection of data relevant to working women in dentistry and their professional work pattern. Currently, we are collecting personal data from women dentists around the globe, as well as from National Dental Association. So please ask for this questionnaire form from WDW or FDI, fill it out, submit it online. Your participation is very important to us. Here you can see the current board members of Women Dentists Worldwide. Here are the past presidents who served for WDW. The Women in Dentistry Project is a joint endeavor of FDI and WDW to empower all women, showcase how women bring positive changes and advocate for women to be equally presented in dentistry. This year's topic for International Women's Day webinar is Choose to Challenge. While I work on this presentation, I felt the best way to illustrate this topic was to share some of my own personal stories and motivations as examples. My first story begins with a severe flood that wrecked havoc in North Korea. As some of you may know, South Korea and North Korea has been severed from each other, still technically at war as enemies since 1953. In 1995, North Korea was forced to ask for relief assistance because of the insurmountable death and destruction the flood had caused. At the time, a family friend worked at an international NGO that provide food relief to North Korea. Even though I possess very little experience in charity work, I seized the opportunity to get involved and was charged with fundraising responsibilities as well as coordinating food delivery and distribution to North Korea. We monitored medicine distribution within medical facilities, visited pediatric clinics, and donated mobile chest x-ray vehicles to different hospitals. I happened to have stumbled upon this rare opportunity to make a small and somewhat behind the scene impact but this 10 year experience really shaped me to reach out beyond my own professional desires and growth. We don't have to limit our learning or experience to just dentistry alone, rather take the path that can propel and shape innovative and insightful solutions to 
some of the most challenging issues within society. The second story I'm about to share with you started the day after Christmas in 2004. The Boxing Day tsunami engulfed several coastal cities and villages within a matter of few hours, killing over 230,000 people and an immense amount of destruction. Roughly a month after tsunami hit, I organized a tsunami relief team and took two of my, at that time, teenage daughters, Hannah and Esther, with me. Here is my eldest daughter, Hannah, who will tell you a, a little bit about the trip and how it all started. When I was a teenager, my mother and I were watching the news after the tsunami had hit, and it was just devastating, the amount of destruction and just the pain and suffering people were going through and we just felt compelled to do something. And I remember my mother turning to me and going, we need to do something. Uh, I don't know what we need to do, but we needed help. We need to go and do something. It was just a matter of a couple of weeks before we were, you know, on a plane to Sri Lanka. We had, were packing toothbrushes in our basement and headed off to uh, do dental relief work. Uh, you know, the, the whole trip was very life-changing in many ways, uh, as you can imagine. But I think what really stuck with me was the follow-through. People have great intentions. They want to do good. They want to help their community, their society in many more ways than one. When my daughter shared her story, I realized that our attempt will matter or be great if we have the courage to follow through because the women around us will take notice. Moving into my third story, while serving as president of Korean Dental Association, Korean Women Dental Association, which is KWDA, the Women Medical Association wanted to join our overseas volunteer work efforts. So medical doctors, dentists, dental lab technicians, and hygienists traveled to the Philippines and treated indigenous people who lived on floating houses. After hearing about our joint effort with the Women Dental and Women Medical Associations, some of my Chinese dentist friends wanted to team up with KWDA's volunteer team. So we made arrangements for a second trip to Philippines. These Chinese dentists wanted to learn how to deal with the logistics of volunteer work, the strategies that were required for efficient workflow, as well as how they could recruit local volunteers to assist them in their work. We utilized the help of the local volunteers by training them to teach children how to maintain good oral hygiene. The clinical team focused on patients, mostly children with urgent needs. The Korea Chinese, Chinese Dental Volunteer Team met the second time in 2015. It turned out that some of these Chinese dentists were inspired that I took my daughters on volunteer trips. So some of them brought their own children to get involved in volunteer work as well to serve the ethnic Chinese minority, mostly school children, living on the southern border of China. These school children lived in the mountains and the terrain was so treacherous and the journey too long, which made it difficult for them to see their families on the weekday. So they would sleep at the school and rejoin their families on the weekends. Once we had completed our volunteer work, the school children put on quite a show to thank us for our work. This trip allowed the Chinese dentists to confidently take initiative in organizing their own service team so they could independently operate volunteer work on their own. So your passion can be extremely contagious and inspire others to do the same. My next story involves domestic charity work with my 
dental staff, and my fellow church members. We first started a charity initiative by treating the local community that lived near the church who could not afford dental work. When we ran out of people to treat, my pastor of our church recommended that we do volunteer work that was geared towards migrant workers nearby. Migrant workers did not have dental insurance. So we opened a charity clinic for these workers once a month for six years. Sometimes the greatest needs are within your own immediate community. My orthodontic patients, one third of my cases are cleft lip and palate patients. After a few, few years of treating these patients, the surgery team and I felt the need of organizing a support group for club children and their families. We organized and held cleft family camps two years, two times a year for 20 years from 1995 to 2014. In the meantime, I started to notice a more dire need for the camps geared towards teenagers. In Asia, facial defects are a social stigma and kids can experience being bullied and mistreated for this reason alone. Just by meeting and playing with other club teenagers, these children started to form bonds and socialize without hesitation because they share the same struggles and pains. A few years later, I invited these teenagers to join our dental service team to be at the giving end and not at the receiving end of volunteer work. They experienced what it was like to help someone who was even less fortunate for, than themselves. Mothers of CLEP patients are another group of people who suffer from these stigmas and feel a great sense of guilt and shame for the experiences their children go through. I felt the moms needed a support group and organized gathering so they could take the time to reflect, talk, and listen to other moms who had similar stories. I find that supporting cleft lip and palate patients beyond the dental clinic was extremely important and rewarding to see that we could tackle this from many different angles rather than taking just one approach. My final story ends with my first encounter working as an NGO volunteer in 1997. I kept some contact with North Korean dentists through seminars and hands-on teaching. After 20 years in 2019, the most wonderful chain of events occurred. I volunteered to teach North Korean orthodontists in Shanghai, China, and casually mentioned, is there any women orthodontists in North Korea? North Korea is notorious for gender inequality. Surprisingly, they took my comment seriously. And for the first time in North Korean history, four women dentists were dispatched abroad for training. Sometimes the impossible is possible. We just don't know when. All in all, it wasn't always easy for, for me personally to create positive changes in society within the boundaries and balance of home and work life, and to also empower women in and outside of dentistry. Choose the challenges to a call to action to continually change the status quo of, to pave the way and create opportunities for yourselves and others. WD W and FDI are here to empower and advocate women in dentistry. And we hope that you will be inspired to do the same. And that completes my talk. And I would like to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Monica 
Romero Delgado. Dr. Delgado is a dentist and entrepreneur. She is a general manager of Odonto Web, a company of dental product and distribution. And she's a founder of Odonto Police, which is a private dental training center for ed continuing education in Costa Rica. She specialized in business management in INCAE, mom of two girls, 14 and 16 years old, married for 17 years. She's an executive coach, a member of International Coach Federation. She's leader of the group Mujeres Dentistas in Costa Rica. And she's also chairperson of the member liaison and support committee in FDI. Dr. Delgado's title for today is, I dare you to, to see the opportunities, not the limits. Monica, the floor is yours. Hello, Gina, thank you very much. And thank you for your inspirational speech also, because I think that we have to admire each other first and that, that's why we are here. And uh, thank you very much for uh, letting me join this section. I think that uh, this is our contribution. We have all been in places where we have been need help of someone else. And now the stage brings us here to pull another woman. And I really feel that there, this is a blessing for me. So I want to start sharing my presentation. And as you can see, as you can, as you said, my presentation is uh, about how can we see more the opportunities that we have than the limitations that we have. And when we say about uh, the challenge, uh, today we have a lot of challenges that we can really uh, be together and that we can challenge to each other. So, um, okay, I'm going to start this presentation. And uh, first, tomorrow is a very special day, is a Women's Day. And this celebration is so important for all of us uh, because I think that women and story uh, has been gathering together for a lot of reasons, for human rights, for women rights, for because we have a lot of fights that we have to do together and that we have, we have been winning a lot of them. We still have a lot of homework and a lot of work to do, but also it's, it's so pleasure that we can also find spaces to have only a fraternal spirit like today, where we can learn from each other, where we can uh, meet each other and we can grow together. <clears throat> I want to, um, okay, here. Let me see where uh, this, okay. So the first thing that I think that we have to do is that we have to build ourselves, that we not only need our friends, our colleagues, our other women, but we have, when we're alone, we have to work in ourselves, in our spirit, and we have to start learning and, and believing in ourselves a little more. And that's what, the, the, what I bring here today. This is the message that I want to, to share with you today. And I want to start with a question. If you have been pregnant before, I want to ask you how many of you, how many pregnant women you noticed when you were pregnant? When I got pregnant, I was, it was funny because I said, suddenly everybody is pregnant. Why everybody is pregnant? Or maybe you are seeing or, or you want a model of a car and you're trying to study this model and suddenly you start seeing this car in the street a lot of times. Why is that? Is more people pregnant when we are pregnant or is everybody buying the car that you want when you are interested in a car? The, probably the reason that we have is that when we are focused on something, when we are thinking about something, we are more conscious about that. We are more alert about that. And we can recognize these, these things uh, more often. So the truth is that we are seeing through a lens and everybody is seeing to a different lens. We see a life from a different, uh, the lens of our fears, 
from the lens of our interests or the lens of our limitations or the lens or our ambitions. That's why when we are worried or when we just very worry about that something, a weakness of mine that I have, and I'm very focused on my weakness, probably I'm going to see my weakness everywhere. Or if I see challenges, I will see those challenges everywhere. So what we have to start to think is about how can I really work on my mind so I can really see more opportunities than limitations. So, but don't feel guilty because some of us always see the negative side of it. Don't feel guilty because there is a question. Why is easier to see our limitation than the opportunities that we have? And the reason is, uh, is that this is a behavioral um, conduct or behavior that for surviving behavior that we have as human beings. It's what we call a survival strategy. When the human being uh, used to hunt to survive. So the point is that if you ignore an opportunity so you can regret it or you could be hungry all day, okay? But if you will ignore a danger, that could be the end or death. That's why our mind is more, uh, is more open to see the limitations or the danger than to move into the opportunities. So that's why our mind, our human mind, will also show us more uh, big the, present, the presentation of our limitations. And even that, we don't, we don't born with a, with, with a manual of happiness. We are in a society that will tell us a lot of, of things that we are going to, to behave like what they people tell us how to do it. They are going to make us doubt of what we can do or what we cannot do. We're also going to copy the patterns of what we see. I do remember that when I was a teen and I was fighting with my mom and I said, I will not do what my mom, as, I, I'm, I'm not going to be as my mom when I have teens. And now I have a teenager and I can find my mom behavior in me again. Because we also, we copy a lot of what we see or what we have learned in our, in our homes and also what we hear. If we have always heard that you're talented and you're beautiful and you're precious, so you're going to feel that way. It's not easier if you come from a family or an environment that has dared you to, to a lot of, of limitations and that has repeated a lot of times that you cannot do that or has established a lot of barriers to, to it. So also, I'm going to tell you a story as, as Gina talking about the FDI, as, as Gina mentioned, um, Gina mentioned a part of me. I, I say in the, in, the, in the presentation, I say that I, I have some things good and I have a lot of failures, but my failures cannot be listed in my presentation. We all have uh, a lot of failures and I want to share with you today something that was very, very good for me and that maybe was will, will gonna be helpful for you. That's what I have called that three minute chance story. And I'm gonna tell you the story of when I become elected in, in the FDI for first time as member of the license and support committee. As you may know, FDI structure uh, has five committees is the dental practice committee, the education committee, the membership license and support committee that I'm leading right now, the public health committee and the science committee. FDI, what uh, they have representatives or they open the nomination. So everybody, if you are a member of the FDI, you can be in this committee. How can you do that? Well, you have to, of course, you have to fulfill some requirements that they ask, but every year FDI calls out for nominations to all the FDI associations, dental associations, and they can propose the candidates 
for nominations for the committee that they want to they want to participate. So as uh, any other dental association, my association got the invitation to an open position in the member liaison and support committee. So this is the letter, this is an example letter, but this is the letter that FDI sends every year when there are open positions. So I really encourage you, if you really have something to give, if you have a, a, um, a background in these fields, be aware of this, participate, okay? So you are gonna find that a call for nominations and we send this mail several times and uh, they send a link and there, there is a form and there you can see the open positions and all the requirements for this. And then you have to come to the assembly, to the Congress, and you have to participate through a votation or to be chosen by the council. There is, it's up to the position that is going to be. But the funny thing is that here, um, I got the, the notice of my dental association that I was going to be nominated for this. And at the first time I was very excited because okay, but you know, when you are not very involved with FDI, because 10 years ago I was not as involved that I'm now, and I didn't know FDI, you don't understand how big is FDI and how many things they can impact and how in how many fields you also can you can give to FDI. And at that point, I was very happy and I was very proud. Oh, great, I'm going to have the opportunity to show about who I am or, or what I've been doing. So there is, there is a chance for me. The funny thing is that they say, you only have a three minute presentation in the podium to present yourself and tell all the assembly that that means hundreds of people, uh, why they have to vote for you. And I do remember that I got to the first Congress and I just saw hundreds of people in the assembly. And I was sitting there, I said, oh my God, I just made a mistake. How am I going to stand in this podium? And I am just, I'm just a, a little person from Costa Rica. How can they can know me or how can they vote for me? I really was very nervous the first time that I saw the first assembly of FDI. And uh, I remember that I went through some breakfasts and uh, I was gathering there in the breakfast with some people who was also a candidate. And uh, they were their candidates for so, so many times. So they have not been elected. And uh, everybody say like, try next year. Or where is Costa Rica? Is that a country or where you come from? Or, or try maybe next time or, okay, it's, it's good you to be here. It's, it's impossible, but you're going to earn a great experience. So I really came back to my hotel that day and I say, well, I think that I did not understood that this is going to be very hard and that this is going to be almost impossible to get elected from here. So I really think that I went to the hotel as we do a lot of things in our lives. We see an open door and we know that we can go through that door and that we can really knock that door, but we decide to walk away from the door because we think that we cannot fit in. And I was in the hotel just there and I said, well, I have two choices here. Uh, just quitting before trying or just give the best of me in that three minutes. And uh, what I can tell now that I can find uh, as a tool that in that moment is what we, Daniel Goldman, that is a psychologist, he called uh, emotional self-awareness. Emotional self-awareness is the ability that we have to understand our own emotions and how this is affecting my performance and that you are know that you are feeling and why and how it helps and hurts if you are what you are trying to do. So when you find this and you say, well, this is the way I'm feeling, it's normal, I am in fear, this is new for me, 
okay, what is the worst thing that can happen? I can show uh, who I am. I can show what I have to give to OFDI. So I think that that day in that hotel, I could find myself in the mirror and I'd say what I want to tell you today. I challenge you to see the opportunities and not the limitations. I challenge you to see how powerful you can be, how valuable is your experience, how valuable is all what you have done in life, that even when you just have three minutes to present yourself or to introduce yourself, probably it's not going to be enough because, but we have to take that chances and, and hug them and just, I'm going to, to fight for this opportunity. You know, emotional self-awareness is not something that I say, well, this is a gift that I have and I'm going to handle my emotional self-awareness every time. No, emotional self-awareness is an exercise. <clears throat> it's the exercise of every situation. It's something that you achieve once. It's not something that you achieve once and you have it for the rest of your life. You have to, every moment, you have to experience this opportunity to be self-aware of what I'm feeling, why I'm feeling this, what, how can I help myself to restructure my mind, to think of the positive things and to face this fear or to face this challenge with a, a positive attitude. So I wanted to challenge to do some, and this is the conclusions that I have. I wanted to challenge you today to knock on the doors that you want to be open. Some of us are staying quietly, just waiting for our dreams to come or our doors to come, but we are not every day knocking at the doors that we really want to be open. So my mom used to tell me something. If you wait there, God is not going to come to you and give you everything. God wants you to see you looking for that every day. And it's the same thing that I think now. If you, we don't knock on the doors that we want, if I want to be better uh, in a specialized uh, career, so maybe you have to move on. Just ask for what are the programs that they have in your country or what possibilities you have to travel. Or if you want to be alone and not being where you're working now, you have to start. Start with a plan. Start with, with putting some, a, a draft. Start dreaming. Because if we really don't start knocking at that doors, that doors will never be open for us. And then I want to challenge you today to close the wrong doors. Sometimes we live every day just saying, this is the life that I have. In, I have to live with this. This is the people that uh, I have in life and I've been surrounded by these people. It's negative people is always telling me how bad I am in this. They are not making me grow, but this is where I have to stay. No, that's not, that's not true. We need to start close doors that are not good for us. Uh, maybe doors are habits, bad habits that we have. Uh, or people that we really need to take out of our lives, or we have to close a stage and we have to start another. So we have to challenge you, not only knock at the correct doors, but to be brave enough to close the doors that we really want to be closed now. And I challenge you today to surround yourself with the people who really add value to your dreams. I can tell you right now that I can tell you the names of the women who has inspired me at this point and women and friends that today are connected because it's like 6 a.m. in the morning. We are a Sunday, 6 a.m. They should be sleeping, but they are there because it's women that are supporting, that women that are leaders, that are women that are encouraging other women. So if we really want, uh, to be, to grow and to be better, we also have to choose the people who is with us, the people who can come with us, the people who can trust in us, the people who can <clears throat> also tell us, hey, you're bad, you're, you're doing in the bad way, come back to your path. So this is so valuable and we have to choose good people, 
positive people that they can really feed our souls and motivate us to be better. <clears throat> and the most important thing when you have a leading position is that you're not leading for you and you're not leading to be uh, proud of yourself or to tell everybody how many awards you have. The challenge when you are a leader and when you have a spot, a, a little, little bit of, of light is now it's your turn to open the doors for others. And that's purpose. That's something about purpose. And as women, we think that, okay, I'm not yet a leader. No, yes, you are a leader. You are the leader of your daughters. You are the leader of your, of your people who work to you, with your dental assistants. We are in leading position everywhere we are. And we have to lead with it, with, with love, with example, with motivation. And I, you know that I have been leading from my mistakes. Sometimes I don't have something very good to show, but I can show the mistakes that I have done. Just don't follow that. So we can lead from so many other um, perspectives, but we need to help other women to open these doors for them. And uh, as to close, I just wanted to challenge you to promote your positive thoughts. Start to see in these opportunities is a, is a mindset, okay? Uh, you can see your opportunities more clearly when you are more happy when who you are, when you are feeding your life with all the things that you need, when you feel surrounded by those who are really uh, adding value to you, and when you are really following your dreams and when you have a purpose of helping others. So I really want, and I love the, the topic of this, of this meeting, because we have to be challenged every day. We need to be challenged every day when everything that we are doing. I wanted to close my presentation with a, with a song. Well, I'm not gonna sing or not gonna play the song, but I'm gonna have to relate it here. And it's a song of Carl King, and it's called Beautiful. And um, there is a paraphrase that says that you have to get up every morning with a smile in your face and show the world all the love in your heart. Then people going to treat you better. You're going to find, yes, you will, that you are beautiful as you feel. And I like this song very much because sometimes we have to wake up and say, yes, I'm going to conquer this day. I'm going to put a smile on my face and I'm going to start to see me beautiful first. And when I see myself beautiful, when I see myself talented, when I don't see the limitations but the opportunities and then treat you, gonna, people are gonna treat you better. People was going to perceive this feeling in you and open doors are going to be open. So thank you very much for letting me here. And uh, I encourage you, I hope that this is something that we can do a lot of times and a lot of the women that we have today as participants can also be the panelists and that we can grow together and that we really can conquer a lot of things that we're really dreaming. Thank you, Gina, for the presentation and Rachel for the organization and all the FDI women uh, section. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. Oh, thank you, Monica. Bravo. Thank you. Um, yeah, I learned something today, which is um, it's easier to see your limitations and not opportunity. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I would like to present the next speaker, Dr. Purnima Kumar. Dr. Kumar is a professor of periodontology at the Ohio State University. She received her dental degree from Anamalai University in India and her master's in periodontology and PhD in molecular biology from the Ohio State University. She's a diplomat of American Board of Periodontology 
In, in addition to her clinical practice, Dr. Kumar maintains an active research program in human microbial ecology that is funded through NIH and oral healthcare corporate partners and has authored over 100 papers and book chapters. She's the editor in chief of several journals, uh, presently serves as the chair of continuing education oversight committee for the American Academy of Periodontology and the vice president of the Periodontal Research Group. The topic for today is women in academic research. Pranima, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm, I'm truly honored to be part of this amazing, this amazing group of people on, on, on such, a, such a wonderful day, right? The one day that we actually get to celebrate us and, and talk about us. I apologize for, for all the background sound effects. I had to unexpectedly fly to India. I landed here this morning, I'm, I'm beyond jet lag. So if I say things that don't make sense, they don't make sense. <laughs> so, so with all of those apologies, I'd like to talk to you about the challenges women face the real challenges that women face on a daily basis in, in academia, especially in, in academic research, and, and you know how these challenges somehow are magnified because we are in a, in a dental setting where um, caregiving and teaching students to, to provide care takes priority over um, understanding the, the etiology of disease, for example. The business of dentistry takes over before you know, the science of dentistry sometimes in some institutions. So I'm going to share my screen in a, in a second here. Um, that will be it. So, so I'm calling it the Hunger Games because it truly does seem sometimes to be Hunger Games. You know, we end up fighting with each other, we sometimes end up, you know, picking sides and, and forget that ultimately the goal is for all of us. There is no place for just one woman at the top. There's place for all of us, you know, when all nine, as, as RBG said, you know, when, all, when there are nine, we, we, we always have, sometimes forget that there should be nine at the table, not just one. And so, so sometimes, and, and this, is, this is almost an epigenetic change, something that's been embedded into our DNA, um, that, that we feel there's one place. And, and once you've reached it, they want to protect that, that place. So I'm calling it the Hunger Games. So, so there's a lot of research. If you look at today's dentistry, if you look at the dental demographic of the dental students, in, in 53 institutions throughout um, the world, at least 53 institutions that have been studied throughout the world, and I don't just mean colleges, I mean the big um, um, societal bodies like the American Dental Association or, or the uh, British Dental Society, things like that, the big institutions, they have identified that anything from 63 to 79% of the student population, the dental student population is female. So there's a very, very, very large percentage of women who graduate dentistry. And yet we find that when you come into the academic world, there aren't as many female professors. And if there are female professors, they are mostly on the clinical side and, and you don't see many of them in, in academic research. And the, this question is not unique to, this, this challenge is not unique to dentistry. It is in every field, especially in the STEM fields throughout. And there've been four large, um, barriers that have been identified. And the first one, and I'm going to address this in, in this order, I'm going to first talk about the consequences of bias, the bias that is present. And I'm not going to talk about the types of bias because we all know implicit, explicit, you know, societal, all of those biases. We're not going to talk about them, but how does this bias impact the career of an aspiring clinician scientist or an aspiring scientist in a clinical department? The, the second thing I'd like to talk about is, is mentoring and development and how that is critical throughout a female uh, academician's career and, and where those traps are when sometimes a woman can fall through the cracks. The third, and to me, the, a very important aspect that I see with my grad students and my junior faculty really suffer with is the safety net. 
when you have to cho make choices between your family and your work because your work does not support your family, there is a problem. And the converse is also true. When you have to make a choice between your work and your family because your family doesn't support your work or the societal norms, expectations out of you do not support your work, that affects your work-life balance. So we'll, we'll, I'm going to try and see if I can address some of these challenges in these four um, large, broad umbrellas. The first one I'm going to talk about is the consequence of bias. And I'm going to start with the story. So I had just published my first paper in... in um, science and i was standing up at an iadr meeting the international association of dental research meeting and um, i was presenting a follow-up study or, or some other study when when a group of, of uh, scientists stood in front of my poster and, and started looking at it and i said oh can i help you with questions and we started chatting about this and they said oh where is dr kumar and i looked at him and said i am dr kumar that person literally looked me in the eye. And, and when I stand up, you will all realize I'm five feet three and absolutely no more than that. So this person had to really look down at me. He looked down at me and he said, no, 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 no. Kumar is a man. I said, no, look at me. This is my name. And I showed him my IADR badge and said, this is Kumar, the same name as that. This is Kumar. This is me. And he said, wow, you have done some really fantastic work. And, and, you know, to me, that was the first time I had encountered that kind of an implicit bias, that if there was um, work that had come out that was of very high caliber, then the natural assumption was that it had to have come from a male because a woman was not capable of producing that kind of work. So, so and, and just like Monica said, as soon as you're pregnant, you start looking for pregnant women, right? As soon as I had encountered that bias, I started looking for other examples of bias in, in other people's lives and then started, started wondering where this was going. And, and I found numerous, numerous examples. There are studies that have been done about this that show that, you know, um, when people were given um, um, CVs, uh, you know, bio sketches of, of two groups of individuals without their name, they tended to pick the name the male name because they found, found that this male name was more capable of doing the work, was more um, capable of leadership. So, so there are lots of studies. There are publication biases, a male name always. I mean, we've known this since the times of T.S. Eliot and, and J.K. Rowling recently, right? If you write under a male pseudonym, your, your novel can sell better. It's true in science. Your, your male name is definitely going to bring you a lot more um, recognition easier recognition, faster recognition, more certain recognition than will having a female name. Same thing with funding. Funding is attached to publication, which is then attached to promotion and tenure. Promotion and tenure is another place where women do encounter some level of bias, not simply because um, they are, um, you know, they have to, they have life events that can change their promotion and tenure clock, which is a different story, which we'll talk about a little later, but also because people don't see women as leaders. Women are seen, see, always seen as a support system. So it's great, you, you climb up the ladder, you come to a certain level, and then there the glass ceiling hits you because you are not seen, perceived as someone who's capable of, of moving ahead, of leading a community, of being an effective leader. And therefore, at that point, your leadership clock, you hit that glass ceiling and you stay there. And the other thing that holds a promotion and tenure is women are given busy work. Women are not given work in, in an academic setting. Most women are asked to, to take on tasks that do not fit the male profile. And so there's a lot more teaching, not high level course directorship type of teaching that will bring you actual credit for your promotion and tenure, but lecture in this course, take part of that course, you know, go serve in the clinic floor, things that will not actually add up to providing you with a portfolio. So there is no recognition that a woman's portfolio has to be as robust and as well managed as a male portfolio and therefore that is a problem. The other big big um, challenge women face is in identifying and cultivating and keeping mentors at every stage. The first is early stage. Women postdocs, there, there have been at least 67 studies and I just looked them up a few minutes ago, at least 67 studies that show that women postdocs do not find early stage mentors, that, that male mentors are less likely to take on female postdocs and mentor them through a, uh, an independent investigator. So there are a lot more female postdocs, there are a lot more female research scientists, but when, when it goes from, from doing a postdoctoral or a graduate level to actually establishing yourself as an independent investigator, a mentored independent investigator award, 
that is where the biggest roadblock that is where the roadblock to women starts so so these women have a huge issue in identifying and uh, you know cult cultivating these early stage mentors the other big thing is known as the associate professor trap we know how to work hard as women we know really really how to work hard we work super hard we cross that challenge from the first assistant professor to associate professor in the united states we have those steps it's almost like you have to spend four to five years in an, as an assistant professor develop a research portfolio develop a a path to being a tenured professor and that brings you to the associate professorship and a tenure from the associate professor to the full professor is almost a double jump and that is that jump is where most female academicians fail they do not make the jump from the associate professor to the assistant uh, to the full professor and that's known as the associate professor trap and a large factor in that again is mentoring people who will identify you and show you what how you can move from this one stage to the next stage and the main reason that they have identified for this is that most of the mentoring that is needed in your mid career typically happens outside of work and this is a time when most women have started focusing on family there are family commitments that prevent them from doing this outside of work there is no going out to your buddies with drink there's no meeting someone for for coffee before or after or catching up for something that is a very difficult thing to do and there is limitations on women being um funded to attend meetings if i know for a woman there the for a woman to to be eligible to present at a meeting she has to have presented at the meeting not simply attended to network so those kinds of networking meetings funding is significantly low in female led departments in female intensive departments in in academic departments that do not are not attached to a large uh, clinical facility and because of these opportunities where women cannot go outside of their own little insular world either within within their own community because they have family commitments or because they cannot go to a meeting that's not being funded the mentoring that happens after work so so the whole mentoring after work is set up against the male psyche right that you can all all buddies go out for a coffee go for golf go for this so that kind of a buddy system works against women when they come to this and because of this role models who are very successful they call triple threats right you're a successful researcher you're a successful clinician and you're a successful um um leader the triple threat those role models the female role models are getting lower and lower and lower that that pool is becoming smaller and therefore finding that role model who will support and sustain you is getting to be super difficult the third important barrier is safety nets for most women their early career stage development begins coincides with childbirth and other life events and there is very little sustaining yes most programs offer a tenure holiday it says that instead of being on the tenure clock for 5 years you can take a year off for every child that you have you can have you know for for life events like marriage you can take time off so you can extend your tenure clock but that tenure holiday comes at a price and that price is significant because it comes at your salary increase tenure is associated with a salary jump promotion is associated with a salary jump for most women academicians that is the biggest salary jump they're going to get the longer you postpone that that comes at an economic thing so so women try to try and choose between this or that should i balance my family should i prioritize my family and their commitments now or should i push through and work for my tenure and get that tenure and then move forward in that thing so that is an issue well, and what what is the biggest barrier child care facilities only 23% of workforce only 23% of academic workforces offer daycare facilities that are close to within the 5 mile radius within a 5 mile radius of your work 5 miles not not a few steps 5 mile radius of your work only 23% of academic institutions in the united states offer that there is absolutely no facilitation i can tell you my own institution does not have a private space for feeding your baby or pumping you have to do it in the privacy of your office or you have to do it worse in a toilet the, the these are these are real issues that women face and these are the ones these are extensive i'm sorry there was something there's something backfired in the back i'm sure you all heard that there are extensive barriers that these women face and the last thing of course is societal barriers women are supposed to wear pink play with dolls have babies get married raise the family play a primary role as a child giver in child care giver in the family they are supposed to be chief cook and bottle washer and if you're writing a grant oh i know you're writing that grant but please the baby is crying can you take care of the baby and then do that thing these are societal roles there are also there are also you know domestic partnerships that 
when your when your domestic life does not support your work life i am really not getting into the, that that kind of a situation now but those are real those are not as well addressed as the relationships and the issues that people face at work and the last of course is distribution of effort at work women 73% of women 73% of female academics in dentistry report that they have a higher distribution of workload than do their male colleagues so i i perceive these four as i look at my junior faculty as i look back at my own life and the struggles i have had challenges i have had to to rise through each of these steps and to succeed at all of them these are four very very real issues what can we do we need active advocacy talking about this you know is is great but we need to start developing policies and that is where organizations like uh, like this the wdi come into come into the fdi you know these these come into great play these are these are places where these are group things these are think tanks for for how we can develop a model a sustainable model for advocacy and and do it worldwide not institutional not in a small level but large well and the most important thing let's let's uh, let's embrace this choose to challenge let's start challenging gender and societal norms not on a one by one individual because then you're a nasty female or you're an aggressive female or or someone's going to put you into a box but as a group as as larger ripple effects as larger and larger and larger groups let's just let's just start choosing to challenge the gender and societal norms and most importantly let's start developing lean in communities i benefited a great deal from a fantastic lean in community i had of of really um cynical mentors who looked at me and said no that won't work i'm telling you we've been there we've tried that we've made that mistake don't go back and repeat that mistake life's too short for you to keep reinventing the meal the wheel go for and do something else so so that was one thing that we did and just like monica taught us choose to challenge your own self image the biggest barrier to your success is you you are like alice in wonderland right you think that door is too big or too small for you to go through you think that the key is too big or too small you want the you know the shrinking or the growing portion but choose to challenge your own self image there is nothing you cannot do if you choose to do it and and we all know that we have tried that in different different times in our lives and said yeah i didn't think i could do that but i did do that let's take that one beautiful success story that little nugget of success and expand it to each and every event and say let me try this all i can do is fail and not be afraid of failures i am going to stop here and thank you all for for your attention and for inviting me to be part of this amazing group i'm so proud of us go girls thank you pranima um i i feel everything that you said <laughs> like early stage mentoring we did not have uh, we were being a threat and we don't have safety nets the social roles that was pounded on us and um let's make a active advocacy group here and we, let's make connections thank you so much for your wonderful lecture oh kinka it's yours now Thank you, uh, thank you, Gina. I would like to present next speaker, Dr. Rizvana Lata. She is currently working as a consultant in public health on the COVID-19 response at the National Infection Service, Public Health England, England, and an honorary clinical teacher in dental public health at the University of Sheffield. Her academic work has applied feminist analysis to dentistry. Her writing on dentistry, healthcare, and public health matters has also featured in non-academic publications, including the Tribu Tribune and Now Then. So I would like to invite for the uh, with the next presentation, Dr. Rizvana Lata. Uh, titled The Challenges of Intersectional Feminists. Welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you uh, for that introduction. And um, I don't have any slides, um, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna talk. And so I'm mainly gonna talk about intersectional feminism and I'm gonna 
briefly describe what is intersectional feminism, where the concept has come from, and why it matters within dentistry, and why we should think about things from an intersectional perspective. So intersectionality is a term that we hear quite a lot at the moment recently, but it's been around for a very long time. It was, it's, it's a term first coined by Kimberley Crenshaw, who is a black uh, lawyer and an academic uh, in 1989. And what Kimberley Crenshaw essentially is saying is that uh, what we as people occupy more than one social position. We have more than one identity. So, you know, we can be mothers, we can be women, we can be women of colour, we can have a disability. And because we have more than one so social identity, we can be discriminated in more than one way. Um, and those discriminations, what can happen is they can converge. And not only do they converge, they often compound. And that's why we need to think of things from an intersectional perspective. And uh, when we apply these frameworks of feminism, if we want to think of things in a much more unified and in a solidarity way, and what Kimberley Crenshaw did is in her seminal work, Map Mapping the Margins, what she did was she uh, analyzed legal cases because her background was in law and, to sh and she showed that one of the problems that we have is our conventional structures aren't designed to think of things in an intersectional way. And that's why some women are often excluded and marginalized further. So one of the key seminal cases that she looked at was General Motors in America in during the 1970s recession. They were, you know, laying off lots of people because there was this recession. And uh, what, what came about, these five women took General Motors to court for discrimination, not because they were women, they were, they were black women, not because they were black, not because they were women, but because they were black women. Because General Motors, what General Motors did before 1964 is they hired black men and they hired women, but they didn't hire black women. So what they were saying is actually this policy particularly discriminates against us because every single black woman is going to get fired and this is an intersectional form of discrimination and when it went to the courts the courts didn't recognize it because they had this single issue framework and it was hugely problematic and now this has always been the case that we when we think of feminism or we think of anti-racism or the forms of equality and solidarity issues we always take the single um single framework approach which can be hugely problematic but in particular in speaking about feminism and thinking about feminism what it does it, it, it really does exclude the narratives of women and it really matters in terms of the story and what is framed and centered in the story so for example when Kimberley Crenshaw talks about when we think about slavery, we think about horrors of slavery, what we don't think about and what is not at the forefront of our minds is the additional horrors that women faced. There was rampant sexual abuse of women, gendered abuse and gendered violence. You know, in 1790, there were 700,000 slaves. You know, at the beginning of the civil rights movement, not that long later, there were four million slaves. And behind those numbers is unimaginable horror on a mass scale against women. And we do really need to think about these stories. And the other thing is, even when women are centered, uh, they're kind of, they're, they're the, 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 their particular stories aren't centered and framed in the same way. So when we think about Rosa Parks, we think about the bus story. But actually, Rosa Parks' activism um, started way before the bus story, actually. She represented Becky Taylor in 1944, who was, who was raped, gang raped, coming home from church by six white men. And actually, even though those men admitted to the rape, what happened was two all male, all white juries didn't indict those men. And there were, so it, it wasn't just racism or, or sexism, it was both racism and sexism and probably some class discrimination that was going on there. And now class is 
another thing that's particularly important that we don't really think about and it's not really centered in our stories so for example in 2018 you know in in britain we were celebrating 100 years of suffrage for women uh, uh, and what is never really talked about or centered in the same way is actually you had to be a pretty privileged woman to get a vote, the vote. You had to be 30, you had to own property, or your husband had to own property, which meant that working class women didn't get suffrage. 60% of women didn't get suffrage until a decade later. But actually, those stories aren't centered in the same way. And it, it, it is important to think about that and think about that in dentistry. Uh, and what it means is, you know, when we look at dentistry and we look at our structures, is we do have this tendency to look at things in a single issue framework. And when we apply the intersectional lens, first of all, it can be really difficult to get the data. And when we do get snippets of data, we see that these same forms of compounding discriminations and oppressions are going on in dentistry. So, for example, when we when we when we look at the um, data on female representation in dentistry, what we get is we get lots of data on you know uh, you know lack of representation at board level or senior positions or gender pay gap, um, uh, and if you look, you get uh, data on race as well. But actually, you don't get this intersectional data, or it's not captured in the same way. And it, and when we do find it, we can we can see the problem. So when we look at professorships, um, with there is no data in terms of dentistry in particular. But if you look at university wide in the UK you know, over 8% of professors are, are male and uh, male men of colour, but actually women of colour, it's only 2.3%. So, you know, there's this compounding effect that's going on there. Uh, and again, we see these class differentials as well when we look uh, within the class uh, paradigm as well. So it's really important to think within these, um, these intersectional ways, but also our structures aren't really set up to think in an intersectional way. So Athena Swan, which is uh, an organization in the UK that looks towards um, awarding institutions and recognizing institutions uh, and their gender equity record, until very recently, didn't look at intersectionality. Now they have, you know, things are moving in a better direction and they are looking at things from an intersectional perspective. But what we find is, you know, they only expect data at a um, department, institutional level and departments are excluded. So certainly in UK universities, that intersectional data is still not collected. And one of the key reasons why it's not collected is because there's no one looking. And this is, this is the thing in terms of structures. It does need to be structural and there does need to be a structural push for these things. But the other reason why we need to think of uh, intersectionality is because if intersectional discrimination can play out in very uh, peculiar and very unique ways. And if we're not aware of, uh, uh, if we're not aware of an intersectional paradigm, or if we're not thinking of things from an internet intersectional perspective, it's very difficult to recognize these unique forms of discriminations some women may experience. So for example, when I was in dental school, I was told, and I wasn't the only woman of color who was told this, that I was wasting a space within a dental school because I was just gonna get married and have babies. Um, and you know, someone else could have really used that space and could really do good with that space. Now, it was a woman who said this to me, but she wasn't saying that to the Asian men or the Muslim men, and she wasn't saying that to the white women. It was a particular unique form of discrimination levied against me as a Muslim woman of color, because there were these certain stereotypes that were being played into. So when those, when you kind of apply that intersectional prism or you're aware of that intersectional intersectionality, then when these, very peculiar or unique forms of discrimination play out, you, you are much more able to recognize them and then you can call them out. 
and I say you can call them out or you should call them out, but actually it can be really difficult to call it out because actually we live in a society which makes it very difficult to call out racism and sexism. It's actually, we live in a society where somehow it is much more acceptable to be racist and to be sexist than to actually say to someone you're being racist or you're being sexist. And that's why we have these very abstract terms to describe racism and sexism and other forms of discrimination, unconscious bias or implicit bias. And that is a structural thing because the, there's a fragility there around sexism and racism and other forms of discrimination because the people who are in power and the people who have privilege, they're the ones who have de decided what is racism and what is sexism. And they have defined the parameters and anything outside, and they've defined them at the very extreme ends of the discrimination. But of course, it's across the spectrum. And they really don't like to be called out on these forms of discrimination. And it can be really, really difficult and it can really be challenging, but it's it really important to recognize it, it, that this is happening. And in terms of what we need, what we can do and what we can do in dentistry, well, first of all, as I've said, we really need to think of our structures when we're thinking about equality and diversity think about and really apply this intersectional prism and when it comes to data collection, when it, when it comes to, you know, interview panels, you know, it's, it's very, you know, it's very unusual now in the UK for to have an all male interview panel because there's a recognition that, you know, it's very unfair to, to a female candidate if it's an all male interview panel, but actually all white interview panel perfectly perfectly normal normalized and it's just not recognized that actually the experiences of the the minoritized candidate is you know it's just not as equitable as as the the, the non-minoritized candidate so we need to have these things in place and the other thing um as i said i mentioned class and class is a particularly difficult one and so we often talk about you know when we talk about gender and we started to talk about race a lot more as well but we don't really talk about things like class and disability uh, and sexuality and these other forms of discrimination uh, and we do need to have a much more of an inclusive lens and one of the key things about class is is that it comes it's bound up with so much more and it's really complicated and in some ways it's a lot more fluid than some of the other identities and so it can be very difficult to capture so you know I would say that I, I was from a very working class kind of northern background but now I'm a dentist and I have an academic career and of course there's that fluidity and there's that accruing of social and cultural capital that has come with that and so it can be particularly complicated but again in dentistry when we look at class we see these differential patterns that you know aren't quite captured so one of the things that we have in UK dentistry we have a lot of South Asian dentists uh, and one of the reasons why that may have happened and what that has why that's happened is in the 70s you know Enoch Powell of all people who wasn't exactly known for his um, you know race equality stance but he was a health minister when he was a health minister in the 70s he invited a lot of um, South Asian doctors to come to the UK and plug labour shortages and then the children of those South Asian doctors a lot of them went into you know medical careers went into dentistry and medicine and careers like that but actually so often you can think actually you know when it comes to um, equality and diversity we've got lots of South Asian doctors we don't need to or dentists we don't need to worry about that but actually a lot of working class South Asian people came into the UK as well in the 70s to work in the northern mills and those people aren't 
represented in the same way because they don't have the same social and cultural and economic capital. And it's not something that's captured and it's not something that's recognized. And so by applying an intersectional lens, we can see that there are these invisible these people that are made invisible within our structures uh, uh, and but there's this masking effect we think that we've got plenty of women or we think we've got plenty of you know people of color but when we really break it down we've got a a particular cohorts of people that have been discriminated against or, or aren't represented in the same way and our structures don't really recognize that and the, I mean, the other thing that happens, and 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 people have touched on this, is you know, it, it's sometimes very easy um, to celebrate, you know, the few people that make it to the top, um, and sometimes it, it's not captured that they may have forms of social and cultural capital that other people who have been multiply minoritized may not have, uh, uh, and also it sometimes allows us to see a prison um, because feminism isn't about individual kind of achievements. It, you know, of course we should celebrate the women on, on the boards and the women who are professors and who, who make it. But actually what we need to think about is, you know, the collective struggle. struggle. Is it as easy for a woman to make it as a man? Is it as easy for a black woman to make it as a white man? And it should be as easy. It shouldn't be that one person is having to pound down the door um, and another person, you know, it, it, it is a lot easier, it has to work harder. It shouldn't be like that. Uh, and often we think that structures are okay because we see that one or two women at the top. Um, so people often will say, well, actually, Britain is fine. We've had two female prime ministers. Theresa May was prime minister. But actually, you know, Theresa May was a very privileged, Oxbridge educated, wealthy woman. And, you know, he, he, she presided over, over some of the most horrific, you know, anti-feminist po policies. She presided over Yarl's Wood. And if we apply an intersectional prism we can see why that may be or gives us some understanding because she has much more in common with those oxbridge educated white wealthy male cabinet ministers than she may have you know um uh in in common with a black woman on benefits in you know working class brixton so it, it really kind of allows us to look at things in a much more nuanced perspective and in terms of dentistry, one final thing that I'm going to kind of touch upon is often, you know, it, like I said, it's very easy to think about the people on the top and how we can, you know, you know, admire the people at the top without thinking about the whole structure. And one of the things that happened recently in dentistry in the UK is there was a, a clinical fellowship for, for dentists that was launched by um, the Office of Chief Dental Officer officer's office um, and it was just for dentists and quite rightly it was called out as problematic because it didn't include the whole dental team and and if we think about it what that means what that the whole dental team wasn't included it was that you know uh, dental care professionals or nurses it's a largely feminized workforce relative to dentists and I know people will say well actually we have equal number of dentists um, uh, females as males but actually historically it is a masculine privileged uh, discipline and so it comes with that power that historical power that doesn't come with dental care professionals and so if we apply that prism we can see that this is playing out in all sorts of way uh, with the way people are located within the within the discipline and feminism does need to be have this very uh, a, a strand of solidarity a strand of, strand of solidarity in terms of class in terms of race because otherwise we will only see a particular type of woman making it to the top and we, we can't have that as people have said or the speakers have said this is a collective struggle it has to be a united struggle
Thank you, Rizvana, for your really inspiring talk. Really, I learned a lot from you today. Um, as uh, Monica Fumero talked today, the challenge is to help other women to open the door. I can say that my personal door was open thanks to next speaker, Professor Marzena Dominiak. Uh, she is vice rector for strategic initiatives, Medical University of Wroclaw in Poland, professor and head of the Department of Oral Surgery, Medical University of Wroclaw, president of Polish Dental Association and member of World Dental Federation, FDI, in Education Committee. Author more than 300 publications, five books on implantology, oral and orthognatic surgery. Also, she obtained four patents, international and national, and a lot of different grants and scientific projects. She is section editor in adv advances in clinical and experimental medicine journal, renowned lecturer. Today on our virtual scene uh, with the lecture title, everyone has the Himalayas oral surgery way to the top. Welcome Professor Marzena Dominiak. You have, you are muted, you are muted. Yes, now, uh, now I, I think I'm online. Thank you, Kinga, and thank you, Gina, for the invitation. I try to share with you some slides. Uh, okay, I don't know, it's, it's okay, yeah. It's okay, I try to present in all full screen. Uh, thank you for the invitation for a very nice uh, uh, presentation, my personal, uh, my person. It's a great honor and privilege to be here, to be part of this very prestigious webinars on women in dentistry. Uh, but let's go to my uh, short topic, um, to my, the first part of them is uh, everyone has the Himalayas. This motto accompanies my professional path all the time. It's very important nowadays, but it was especially important at the beginning when every step, even the smallest one seems to be the highest one. Then it was very important to feel own value on every step. But let's go to the, for a moment for the second step in this first part of this, my talk to my topics, to my oral surgery. She became of my way to the scientific and clinical top. These two days, uh, two, two ways, intertwined each other, with each other all the time. At the beginning, I didn't know who I want to be as a dentist. I considered different specialization and one of them, it was orthodontics. But very quickly, during my internship, I got proposition to start work uh, at, on surgery ward at military hospital at Wrocław uh, Hospital. Then start my way to the top, but it wasn't not so easy. Very quickly, I had to change place of my dream to work because of the competition with the men. So I thought then <clears throat> that's probably the next step it can be a university, but once again, the beginning was very hard. I heard from my future head of my department, if you have funds, you would, I would accept it you. So uh, it was very difficult, especially to hear this information at the beginning. But to underline very hard job, every woman in a professional and scientific way, I would like to present some facts from, the, from history. Women have always have, uh, been present in science and development, but their input remains invisible until not long ago. Historians dealing with this subject underline the difficulties and limitations, both historical and cultural, along with strategies women had to adapt to have their work accepted by academics. 
Academics, however, remain skeptical about women's scientific activities, even far beyond 19th century. Although the first woman to practice dentistry was Emmeline Robert Jones in 1935. But very interesting is prevailing belief that, that um, women were not suited to dentistry because of the frail and clumsy fingers. In turn, the first woman earned her DDS was Lucy Tyler. It was in 1866. Those few female scientists of the time were an acceptation proving their role. In general, women gained access to the universities only in 20th century. Nowadays, uh, it is uh, believed that so-called cultural determinism or Matilda effect prevents women from taking active part in science or becoming successful as academics. Let me stress now that these days, okay, uh, let me stress that uh, these days the number of female, female graduates is growing. Women become more and more educated and consequently they start to be more and more visible in, in science. In 2005, in Great Britain, 50% of students in medicine, IT, maths and me mechanics were female. There were, however, clearly visible sex-related uh, differences. Women outnumbered men in biology and medical studies, especially nursing and dentistry, while men took over in maths, physics, IT and mechanics. Athena Unbound, published by Cambridge University Press, presented uh, an analysis of education and employment of uh, female scientists from early childhood to academic positions. The book stated, women to start an academic career to be a success must overcome a number of ever-present sex-related obstacles. So, on the International Women's Day, I would like to wish all fellow female dentists, scientists or researchers all the best in all their activities. I want to acknowledge the hard work and effort put in the development of dentistry. I know this road at this world from inside. And I know, I don't know how hard is I can get for ambitious women. I know it because I'm the first female head of oral surgery department at Medical University of Wrocław, Poland. Also a first editor of oral surgery book for the pre and post students in Poland. Also the first female president on Polish Dental Association. It was, uh, it took place in 2017. But I would like also underline that in 2009, Dr. Kathleen O. Low Lean became the first female executive director of uh, American Dental Association. It was not so big distance between all these two positions. Woman as the first female dean of American Dental Association became in 1975. She took over the leadership for Howard's dental program, a position she, uh, a position she held until 1991. And I would like also underline uh, that uh, one, I'm also one of the five, only five female uh, vice rectors at Medical, uh, Medical Wrocław University in 70 history after Second War. There was, there has never been a female rector. Also, it was incredible that I became a member of uh, FDI Standing Committee as the first woman from Poland and a second candidate in history from Poland. But uh, let's go to my specialization, to, to the surgery. Uh, I would like to say that uh, being a surgeon uh, is not a profession. It is a very challenging choice of your career. It will never let you falter. So what is an ideal surgeon? A person with delicate and precise hands, with inborn diligence and calm, and who continuously learn, 
requires new skills and gets familiar with state of the art solution, techniques and procedures. The very name maxillofacial surgeon sounds really masculine. Does it have its female equivalent? But it is not the question of the gender, it is the matter of person you are. So when I was younger, 10 years ago, 10, maybe 15 years ago, I was invited on Implantological Scientific Board meeting. I was very proud because of importance of this meeting and propositions, but, uh, but also I was one woman from a group of three published delega delegations. But it was the, the beginning of my uh, journey. When the meeting started after a month, I turned out that I was if, uh, that it was even worse. I was only one woman in a group of 100 male surgeons. I was at the end of the corridor and when we went to the lecturer's hall, I heard only noise of black and deep blue suits and only my heart. Then I thought, what I'm doing in this uh, male world? It was terrible feeling in this moment. This fear disappeared when the meeting was started. When the surgery became generally prevailing. That's why I can say that surgery is also is primarily the way of the life. You have to be zero one in the decisions. And I think this made me a female vice rector at medical university. So you remember, never give up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, for your really inspiring talk. Really, yes, we know and we can feel how hard it is sometimes to pass this board, the board of the men. I would like to present our um, last speaker today, Dr. Safa Master, uh, Sally Safa. Um, Dr. Sally Safa, she's a board certified periodontist and alumna of the University of Toronto. She ment maintains a teaching position as a clinical instructor. She also works in private practice in Toronto, Canada. Uh, where she enjoys all aspects of pe periodontal and implant related patient care. She is passionate advocate of wellness for dentists and dental students. Dr. Safa's master research was in the field of psychoneuroimmunology, understanding the effects of stress on the body. This background combined with her education in the field of mindfulness-based stress reduction has allowed her to share the science behind both stress and mindfulness and how it can help reduce stress in our day-to-day -day lives at home and the office. Welcome in the stage is yours, Dr. Sally Safa with the lecture, Challenge Your Thinking. Perfect. Thank you so much. I am truly, truly honored to be here from Toronto, Canada. It's about 8.30 in the morning here, and I know we're all from different time zones, and uh, I'd just like to say hello to all, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this amazing panel. I'd like to share my screen um, now so that we can uh, start. So let me just go to here, and there we go. Okay, so I, uh, again, um, I've been, I'm honored to be speaking uh, to you today. And, uh, you know, there's, there's many topics that, that could have come to mind when I was thinking about what would be appropriate for us to celebrate being women, but also what are our challenges? And really, because of the field of work that I'm in, I decided to talk to you today about challenging our thinking. And I'd like to get into kind of what, what, what are we talking about here? For me, on International Women's Day, it is really appropriate, uh, something that I read on the International Women's Day website that really captivated me. 
And that was, from challenge comes change. And that really encompasses what so many of us as, as women do. We challenge and we change. And this happens, this cycle happens throughout our entire lifetime. In the different stages and phases of our lives, we challenge and then we change. And it is through that process that we grow and we become wise. And through that wisdom that we share with each other is how we grow. And so um, I would like to share with you uh, about my challenge. I have a personal challenge, and I also have had what I believe is my challenge or calling to our female colleagues. And as International Women's Day is here tomorrow in Toronto, I would like to really say that we, we are going to challenge uh, through this next about 15, 20 minutes with each other, challenge our thinking, and then how can we share that with others around us? So through my own personal challenge, I then grew and I'm now sharing that message uh, with the rest of our community, especially female in dentistry. So in order for me to talk to you about my personal challenge, I just wanted to give you a little bit of my background. Uh, from 1999 to 2002, I studied at the University of Toronto. That was my general dentist degree. I then did a hospital residency that was surgery based because I knew that I liked to do something in surgery within dentistry. I then went into private practice for about a year because I wasn't sure what I, if I wanted to specialize or not. I then went back to school to the University of Toronto to study my master's in periodontology. And then I went into becoming an associate uh, periodontist. And then in 2009, I set up my own specialty practice. Well, this timeline is probably very familiar to many of you, my female colleagues. This is 12 years of lots of work, lots of challenge, and lots of pushing. And what you don't see on this beautiful chart, which many of you have in your own lifelines, are the challenges and the ups and downs. This looks good when we present it to each other, but without all the background information, this is just a chart of my timeline. What you don't see here is that in my master's periodontology program, I had my daughter between first and second year. She is now 16 years old. And I, had, I was pregnant with my son at the end of my program. And, that, and he's now 13. And you can imagine having children, being in dentistry, trying to do my board exams and excel what we don't see when, as when we speak to each other as women is really talking about how did I go through this timeline and how, what were my challenges and then how does that influence me as a woman and how can I now share this with my other female colleagues? So what's the story? The story is that I started my journey just like many of you did. I was competitive, I wanted to get ahead, I was in a male dominated profession, and I thought that the best thing for me to do is for me to be able to be a strong woman in dentistry. And that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to excel and I wanted to set up my practice and have it all and balance it all. Well, that came at a cost. And that's a cost that many of us don't speak about. And that's where my passion lies. It comes at a cost because when we try to balance it all, but we only show the best face or we don't show our challenges, this is where we can mislead our other female colleagues. It's when we don't talk about the coping tools that are needed and what we need to strive. That's when we maybe fail each other as women because we're not sharing the challenges. So, what happened to me in my own timeline is that about five to seven years into my practice, I had the feelings of burnout. Many of you have, might, might have experienced this, but really I had, my tank was empty. I was running on very little uh, um, coping tools. I had a lot of stress and anxiety. I was trying to be a, a perfect mother, a perfect daughter, a perfect uh, spouse and a perfect periodontist. Well, all of that built up to the point that I was having lots of anxiety and stress. And if any of you have experienced panic attacks uh, during all of this, all of these years. So I knew dentistry was stressful and people had told me that practicing dentistry was stressful. 
But I started to investigate for myself, what is it about dentistry that makes it stressful? And when I started to dig into research, because of course, we're all scientific minded, and I wanted to know how come we don't talk about the stress in dentistry. And so the research shows us the following. There are many stressors within dentistry. And some of the big ones that come up are the following. Confinement and isolation. We're often working in, in small spaces, alone, no windows. Our profession doesn't allow us to be outside exploring the beautiful nature. We are confined to spaces and then confined further to the oral cavity. This can be a stressful. Work anxiety. We have a lot of specific work to do in such a short period of time. From the time your patient sits in the chair, you might have one hour to do a, do a filling or restoration or to complete uh, an, a complicated extraction and bone graft or to place an implant. We have to begin and complete a procedure within a defined time. This creates a lot of anxiety and a lot of triggering of the sympathetic nervous system. We have the costs of running our practices. We also have fears, fears about how we're performing, but fears about patient complaints here in North America. And uh, you know, we, we do have kind of this, this bit of a fear of our patient's expectations coming in, what they expect and us being able to deliver it. And uh, sure, we have patient complaints and that can be very stressful. We work also on a millimeter scale. That's the tip of that pencil. We work, the, the difference between success and failure is really just a few millimeters. There are not many other professionals that work in that millimeter scale. And because of that, we can have this very, very stressful profession that's gratifying, but quite stressful because of the scale that we work in. And as many of you know as women, Managing staff, if you're a female leader, can be very challenging because you don't want to come off as aggressive, but you have to become assertive. And the difference between that and our challenge in, in the workplace is, is quite something to overcome. And of course, competition. And as, as one of the most recent studies has shown us, that half of dentists say that their job is exceeding their ability to cope. And that's very uh, concerning for me as somebody who works in the stress and wellness field within dentistry. And what's even more concerning to me is that 18% of dentists had seriously considered committing suicide. And that's a massive number. That's not the number of dentists that actually committed suicide. But for me, just the fact that 18% of the 2000 dentists that were surveyed in 2019 considered committing suicide is very alarming for me. So I knew that something had to change. I had to challenge my own thinking first. And I had to see for myself, what are my brain patterns that put me in this very stressed or stressful period of my life? Or just what are the patterns of thinking here? And the first one, which I'm sure many of you can relate to, is the relentless pursuit of perfection. As women, we are always trying to pursue perfection because we were taught like that when we were in school. I want to be the perfect periodontist. Of course, because who doesn't want to have a perfect periodontist? If you want someone to work on you to do work, you want them to be perfect. But that also spills into every aspect of our life as women. I want to be the perfect mother. I want to be the perfect friend and daughter. And so this idea of achieving perfectionism is not realistic and can actually contribute to our extreme amount of anxiety and stress. To the point that I wrote an article about it just this year, and the article is entitled, The Story of a Recovering Perfectionist. So I, probably like many of you, have to work on this every day to, to, to not fall into this pattern of using perfectionism as my standard. And the other, is the imposter syndrome. The only way I can define that is the feeling that you get that you are inadequate compared to everybody else, despite your evident success. All the women here today have probably achieved so many great things to be where they are, but unfortunately, so many women feel that they are inadequate compared to others. And it's a false sense of 
uh, character. However, it's referred to as the imposter syndrome where we are honestly constantly in self-doubt. And the other pattern that I noticed in myself, and you may have noticed this in yourself, is that I always have something going through the mind as constant thinking. Many of us live everything from the neck up. We believe that everything is figured out from the narrative in our mind. And many times what our brain tells us is not true. So the idea is to learn to not believe everything I think. Just because negative thoughts come into my mind doesn't mean I have to believe them. And that takes practice. So how does one change their thinking? How do we change the patterns and the, 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 neural, the neurons that we have already trained this way? Well, I'd like to present it to you as the fixed versus growth mindset. And as many of you may have heard about this, it's from uh, Dr. Professor uh, Carol Dweck's work on mindset. We can either be in fixed mindset or growth mindset. And what does that mean? Fixed mindset is things are unchangeable, that I have an unchangeable attitude, I avoid challenges, I avoid failures, and I would give up easily. Growth mindset is that I make mistakes, I analyze them, I accept challenges, and I believe that I can actually learn something new. For me, the biggest thing was to learn that, I can, that I'm actually not stuck the way I am, that I can change my brain patterns, that I can change my stress or anxiety level. And that would be so important because you would, when you're in growth mindset, you don't believe that you're stuck in this certain situation for the rest of your life. So I challenged myself to explore and be in growth mindset. And so when I started to learn about mindfulness and mindfulness-based stress reduction, I, I was studying and traveling to the US and taking courses in this topic. And what I came across time and time again is that the first step to changing our thinking is to become aware of our thought patterns. Beyond that, everything else can fall into place much more easily. But if we are unaware, of how we view ourselves, of the stories we tell ourselves as women, then we cannot change. And in the business world, this is referred to as emotional intelligence. The idea of being aware of our emotions and then learning how our emotions can be managed and then how our emotions have an impact on others. And as leaders in dentistry and as women leaders, we would be, it would be such a gift for us to learn our emotions, how we can manage them, but how they affect others and how we present ourselves to the world and to other female colleagues would be a gift to the profession. And so we didn't learn this in dental school. This wasn't something, emotional intelligence and awareness of stress, awareness of our body, awareness of our patterns was not something that was communicated. And I learned through the work of Dr. John Kabat-Zinn, who's sort of the, uh, the mindfulness expert, I learned this. Now, don't be, I don't want you to be too consumed with what this chart, every word says. But what I want to present is a thought pattern. Imagine a stressful time or a stressful thing in your life right now. When we get that stressor, that's called an external stressor. When that stressor comes in, let's say we get a bad news or bad review from a patient. We automatically have an internal stressor. So how we feel about ourselves. Oh, that patient complained about me because I'm not doing the best I can, because I'm not the best at this job. There's this internal stressor. Most of us go into what's called fight flight our primitive brain kicks in and we start that fast thinking and narrative of alarm reactivity. We go into a stress reaction. You can see that first box to the left. That sets up high blood pressure, anxiety, flutters. And then what we do is we then start that negative talk or that stress builds up. Over time, that leads to dysregulation. When we don't manage our stressors, we get maladaptive coping. And when we can't cope, we often overwork. We have hyperactivity. We, we resort to lots of unhealthy tools. And many times dentists go into substance abuse, alcohol, cigarettes, smoking, overworking, and that can lead to breakdown. 
So my calling has been to try to change this. And what I'd like to show you is that this chart has another side. And this side is completely different than the other. This side acknowledges we still get stressed. We're, we're humans, we're gonna get stressed. But what happens is we can actually bring in mindfulness or, or good behavioral thought behaviors, and we can then respond to stress rather than react. Instead of getting alarmed and judging ourselves and telling ourselves negative stories, we can actually bring in some helpful tools, we can, instead of going hyper aroused and thinking this is the end of the world, we can regulate our emotions in a zone of tolerance or in, in an area that our emotions go up and down, but we don't go too far up or too far down. And this takes practice to be able to respond to stress rather than react. And so mindfulness is basically learning this process. How do we respond rather than react? And so the first step is just become aware of your, of your patterns, of your brain's thinking. What do you do when you get stressed? You take a pause and you start to realize, do I start negative talk? Do I start getting anxious? Do I start getting cortisol pumping through my system, which we know is cortisol is kind of the bad hormone. And if we can notice our thoughts and our feelings without getting consumed by them, we can then stay above the waves and we can just watch our thinking. And then we can actually choose to behave differently. But if we're caught up in our stress and our negative thinking, then we cannot find our way out. And of course, being a, being a dentist and, and scientific minded, of course, I wanted to see what is the science behind this. And what I learned is neuroplasticity. This is so, so important. Our brains are not static. With work such as mindfulness and emotional intelligence and awareness, we can change the wiring of our brain. It doesn't matter the age or stage in life. We can change the wiring of our brain. And so I started to investigate this more and more through the various courses I took. And I saw that chronic stress, when it's not managed, actually changes the chemistry of our brain. And this was shown through studies that were done out of Harvard in order to see that the two centers in our brain that manage our uh, emotions are the amygdala and the hypothalamus. The amygdala is the fight flight center. The more we shoot up into anxiety, high stress, the more cortisol and adrenaline are pumped through our system, the larger the amygdala gets. That's your fight flight center. And so if this part of your brain gets bigger, of course, you're going to be much more reactive than responsive. And the converse is the hypo hippocampus. The hippocampus is your mood regulatory center. This is the part of the brain that says it's okay, Things aren't so bad, let's put things in perspective, but this part of our brain shrinks with high stress. So therefore people who have lived in high anxiety and stress for so many years have a challenge bringing themselves back down to be able to manage their emotions because their hippocampus has actually shrunk. But the good news is that we can rewire this that our brain has the capacity to re reconfigure itself, but it's going to take work. And so the challenge here is we have stress in dentistry. We can manage it. It takes hard work, but we can actually find coping tools and ways that we can change our brain patterns to be able to respond differently to our stress in dentistry. And so how mindfulness helps us in this is when you have a stimulus and automatically you see yourself react, something bad happens and you immediately are reactionary versus with mindfulness, something happens, we take a moment, in that very moment, you have a choice whether to react or respond, whether that means pausing and not making a decision, whether that means telling your coworker, I'm sorry, I will have to sit on this email for, for a few days and get back to you, whether that means taking a long, deep diaphragm breath, we then can come back and respond rather than react. The only constant in our life is change. And as we've seen through the past few uh, months that everything in our lives are changing, the only constant in life is change. So I challenge you to challenge your own thinking and then see if you can 
change those things that you that that you can to rewire the brain and then spread the message. I thank you so much for your time. And I'm really honored to have been here with you today. And if you'd like any information, these are my contacts and um, I'm happy to ever help in any way I can. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. I agree that human dentist life itself is a challenging. Wow, really, really inspiring talk. I'd like to congratulate and thank you for all inspiring and very important presentation. Be a female leader is challenging, agree Sally. I would like to recall you all to fill our questionnaire, uh, which uh, you can uh, find in the Facebook, One uh, Women Dentist Worldwide, uh, and also here in the chat, you can find the link for this survey. Thank you for that, because this is really important for all of us. Gina. Thank you, Kinka, and thank you everybody for being here with us. Uh, we learn so much from each other and, and we hope to continue uh, building up um, our our community and our strategy to face our future and um, in a better way. Thank you everybody.